for being here. Okay, so I think we should start. Go ahead, Armando, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, beginning. thanks, James. Yeah, thank you, everybody. So good afternoon to everyone on the East Coast and in the Midwest, and good morning to our friends out West. I'm Armando Contreras, the President and CEO of United Cerebral Palsy, and I want to welcome you to this very important discussion regarding a growing trend towards mandatory vaccination requirements in the public and private sector. Before I hand it over to our moderator for today's panel, I want to thank a few folks for helping make this event happen. First, I want to thank our three guests, Ron Ekstrand, David Ivers of Easter Seals of Arkansas, and David, Dr. David Kimberlin of the University of Alabama at Birmingham for taking the time out of their busy days to be with us today. Additionally, I want to thank Cheryl Smith, CEO at UCP of Huntsville and Tennessee Valley, one of our 58 affiliates in the US. Cheryl has, kind, has been kind enough to introduce to us Dr. Kimberlin. Thank you, Cheryl, for, for doing that and has helped us in so many other ways over the years. We're grateful for her support. I also want to thank UCP's communication coordinator, James Garcia, who organized today's panel and who will be moderating today's discussion. Give me a second, everybody, while I let a few people in. I got another 10. Here we go. And finally, I want to thank all of you in our audience who who signed up here to this virtual and vital important conversation. COVID-19, as we all know, has unpended our lives to seemingly no end. And we at UCP hope that today's discussion will provide useful insight into yet another unprecedented issue that, that's a, arisen because of the spread of this deadly disease. An important note, United Cerebral Palsy is not here to dictate what your particular organization should or should not do with regard to this issue. Our role today is as a convener of an open platform that we hope will simply help you inform your decisions about the impact of this issue on, on your particular organization. So with that said, thank you again for being here. And now I'll hand it over to James, who will introduce our guest speakers and guides today's discussion. Thank you, James. Thank you. Thank you so much, Armando. Uh, just to our audience, if you are not one of our speakers, our three speakers, if you could please mute yourself, uh, that would be fantastic. Um, secondly, if you um, have any uh, questions that you would like to pose at the end of the uh, discussion, uh, if you could do that through the chat box, uh, you'll see that at the bottom of your screen. I don't see on our screen right now that we have a Q&A box, so just use that chat box. Uh, to pose your question and then I will present those in order uh, and try to get through them as quickly as I can. Uh, we only have an hour, so let me just jump right into the introductions um, uh, here in just a moment. A quick overview as uh, those of you who've signed up probably know well and have probably been following this issue. Um, the whole question of whether um, employees or volunteers for that matter or, or healthcare workers uh, should be required uh, uh, to be vaccinated uh, in order to, as a condition of sort of their future employment, frankly, um, is uh, something that's just caught fire in the last uh, couple of weeks. And for perhaps obvious reasons, um, the Delta variant is spreading very, very fast as it has in other countries around the world. And uh, numbers of infections uh, have skyrocketed and hospital um, admissions have skyrocketed. Uh, really over about something like 90% of the country. So it's become um, a never present uh, danger uh, and has elevated the conversation uh, with regards to who should be vaccinated and uh, whether they should be required to vaccinate. Um, so we're here to just have a conversation about that uh, with the folks who are dealing with this in real time. Uh, I will start with our, uh, our, our guest from Easter Seals, Arkansas. Uh, Ron Ekstrem is uh, an MBA, serves as a CEO for Easter Seals, Arkansas, has been there since December of 2019. He has more than 30 years of leadership experience, including 10 years working as an executive leader within the Easter Seals movement, and another 20 in various for-profit businesses in managed care, insurance, and financial services. Before joining Easter Seals, Arkansas, Ron served two years as the senior VP of network advancement and affiliate relations at the National Office of Easter Seals in Chicago, Illinois. 
supporting their network of 68 affiliates across the country. He's served as a part-time adjunct faculty member as well, teaching graduate courses on service excellence and, ex excellence and nonprofit mergers and collaboration. And he has seven children, three with identified disabilities and three grandchildren, one with autism. David Ivers um, serves as VP of External Affairs and is the general counsel for East of Seals, Arkansas. Uh, since June of 2020, he's been there. He provides legal advice, services encompassing health law, employment law, contracts, torts, and other legal matters. He's also in charge of external relations with the General State Assembly, Governor's Office, Congressional Delegation, State Agencies, Provider Associations, and others with oversight on the impact on services. And David was previously a partner at Mitchell, Blackstock, Ivers, and Sneden, I hope I'm Sneden, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, for more than 20 years where he represented Easter Seals and many other healthcare clients, including various statewide provider associations. Uh, and he has three children, including one with an intellectual and developmental disability. Uh, and then finally, our third guest, uh, who's, uh, who's going to be our, our kind of COVID medical um, expert uh, resident on, on this panel is Dr. David Kimberling. Uh, he holds the Sergio Stagno Endowment and Jow Chair rather in Pediatric Infectious Diseases at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, where he's Vice Chair for Clinical and Transla Translational Research and Co-Director of the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases. Dr. Kimberlin is editor of the 2021 American Academy of Pediatrics report of the Committee on Infectious Diseases. Uh, and since 2007, Dr. Kimberlin has served as the AAP Red Book Liaison to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. Um, though both uh, through both the ACIP, the, the committee I just mentioned, and the AAP Committee on Infectious Diseases, Dr. Kimberling has been involved throughout 2020 and 2021 in major decisions nationally on the allocation of the COVID-19 vaccines as they have become available. This includes the assessment of the safety and efficacy of the vaccines in populations studied to date and the development of the phased rollout of the vaccine to the American public to reduce transmission, morbidity, and mortality of COVID-19 disease, and to help minimize disruption to society and the economy, including maintaining healthcare capacity and to ensure equity in vaccine allocation and distribution. Uh, so those are our guests today. Um, uh, Process-wise, what I'd like to do today is begin um, with Mr. Ekstrom because uh, Mr. Ekstrom is here and on this panel because his organization, he and his organization, have decided to mandate vaccinations uh, for, I believe, their employees and volunteers. He will explain in detail. Uh, and then we will go from there to Dr. Ivers, or rather David Ivers, who will speak about uh, the impact uh, in terms of um, uh, employee law and their own human resources questions that may have arisen. And then we will have uh, Dr. Kimberling uh, provide some broad analysis on the situation as it stands right now nationally and how that impacts the kinds of decisions that Mr. Ekstrand is having to make on, um, in real time. So first, um, Ron, if you could please go right ahead. Thank you, James, very much for the introduction. I'm happy to share our story here in just a little context and perspective. Um, Easter Seals, Arkansas has been around for 75 years and uh, actually was founded here in Arkansas in response to the polio epidemic, um, serving children in particular who were impacted by, by polio um, with one of the first uh, children's rehabilitation centers in the state. Um, with this situation at the very beginning of the pandemic, since none of us had been through anything even remotely like this, uh, back in March, when we started making decisions in response to the pandemic, we established three criteria that we were going to use uh, to guide us. First and foremost, our number one priority was the health and safety of the people we serve and our staff. So we were quick to adopt um, screening protocols. We shut down our first big fundraiser uh, on March 12th, um, which had over 400 people scheduled. And this was before guidance had been provided yet in the state. 
Um, so we've done a really good job of protecting people. We, we monitor weekly how many positive cases. We serve over 800 people um, and have 300 or 550 people on staff. To date, we've had less than 50 positive tests. Um, only two uh, have ended up uh, in the hospital. Um, and we've had no deaths, including uh, those that we serve in two of our intermediate care facilities, which are very similar to nursing homes. So we've taken that very seriously. The other two that have been sort of balancing priorities have been trying to keep as many programs as we can open um, and therefore jobs for our staff, uh, while also uh, trying to secure the financial uh, survivability of the organization. And um, recently, uh, I'd say about eight, eight or nine weeks ago, when we saw an uptick, because we tracked the number of positive cases, and we had about 12 weeks in a row where there wasn't a single positive case. And I think that was directly attributed to um, the virus or the, the vaccine becoming available. But about eight weeks ago, nine weeks ago, we started talking about, should we mandate? And we looked at every alternative we could think of beyond mandating. Um, we did uh, employee education, we provided incentives, we provided appreciation, we did about a dozen different uh, free vaccine clinics. Um, we uh, shared interviews with uh, family members who were um, discussing the importance of having uh, people who work for the families vaccinated. And, and we have a unique combination of both site-based programs as well as um, home and community-based services, uh, waiver programs. Um, and here in Arkansas, um, a lot of the waiver programs, we have individuals being served by other family members in the program, uh, even though they are technically employees of ours. And so as we were looking at the increasing uh, number of cases, we started talking about uh, the idea of, of um, uh, mandating the vaccine. And in early June, we did a survey of our staff and asked them what their current status was. Now, we had been collecting um, cards from the beginning when we started holding the clinics and asked people to turn in their cards so we could track our, our vaccination rate. Um, we, we hovered around about 50% for the longest time. We couldn't get over the hump, regardless of how many other things we were trying. Um, in the survey, we discovered there was about 15% of our staff who said there was no way they were going to get the vaccine, just flat out no. About 5 to 6% were um, on the fence and would, could be convinced um, with proper incentives, education, um, support. Um, we uh, looked at the data and... Um, sort of leading up to this, there were a number of factors coming together. We know that there is a staffing crisis uh, for our field. And um, we were paying about $12 an hour for starting minimum wages for people who were coming to us in our direct support professional roles. Well, um, we were able to secure funding through the Employee Retention Tax Credit Program as part of the American Rescue Plan. And we have devoted that uh, to wage increases for our frontline staff. In fact, we raised minimum wage for all of our staff, regardless of their position, to a minimum of $15 an hour. It coincided with the same time the state of Arkansas was exiting from the enhanced unemployment benefits, which meant there was likely going to be more people re-entering the workforce. So prior to man mandating the vaccine, for all current staff at the beginning of July, at the same time we announced the increase in our rate of pay, we also um, implemented a uh, policy of not hiring anyone new who would not be vaccinated or who would not uh, agree to get the vaccination. So in this last month, we've had three starting classes of new hires, all of which have been um, some of our largest that we've had on, on record since we've, we've been doing new, new higher orientation. Um, as we are starting to be more competitive with our wages, 
Um, but we have also met very little to no resistance from new hires on the mandate. So for those of you contemplating um, how to get started, mandating it for new employees is a great place to start. So it doesn't exacerbate the problem down the line. Many folks are concerned, you know, that wasn't what people agreed to when they joined our organization. So how can you mandate it for someone who is an existing employee? Um, so that's why we chose first to, to announce um, and, and put into practice uh, not hiring anyone new uh, who wasn't vaccinated or agreeing to get the vaccine in the first 40 days. Uh, on July 22nd, um, we made the decision and announced it um, through a series of press releases, uh, internal communication, um, staff meetings, um, and communications to the families we serve, as well as social media, that we would be mandating uh, the vaccine. A um, couple of things have happened since then. Um, all four of our major media outlets in, in the Little Rock area picked up the story online, um, just reinforcing what we had done. The same day we had announced, uh, I think we were the second employer in the state behind a, a hospital system up in Northwest Arkansas uh, to mandate the vaccine. Um, the same day we announced, there was another hospital system that announced. And just yesterday in the state, uh, Tyson Foods announced that they're gonna require vaccines of all their employees. Um, I think you were gonna find that there's gonna be a, a, uh, a, a trend here of more employers realizing the only way out of this dis difficulty is by, by mandating the vaccine. It was one of the last things that we wanted to do. Um, huge believer in personal freedom. Um, however, people's choices were impacting the lives of others. We were having to shut down programs as people were coming in uh, and being uh, positive. Uh, at one point, we had to shut down four of our preschool classrooms uh, resulting in about a $20,000 loss in revenue. And so we tried to explain how these things are connected. Your individual choices of not getting the vaccine, coming in, exposing others, causing us to shut down programs, impacting revenue, impacts our ability to also continue to create a great work environment, including the higher wages that we were trying to implement. So um, we have focused on, again, from the beginning, trying to provide a safe, uh, and healthy work environment. In terms of any kind of negative uh, feedback, I think I had one donor call, um, not identify themselves, tell us that they were never gonna donate to us again. We had no way of verifying who it was when we did a reverse lookup of the phone number. It appeared to be a, a one of those spoof phone numbers. So we're not sure where that came from. Um, and then all of the media, uh, all the social media postings that we had, all the comments and feedback we have gotten have all been positive and our families have been overwhelmingly supportive. Um, I would say we are making three um, types of exception requests uh, and honoring those, two of which we're legally required to do, uh, at least here in the state of Arkansas. One is a medical exemption and the other is a religious exemption. Uh, and David was very instrumental in helping us create forms uh, for documenting what those are. Um, but we also did something different because outside of our site-based programs, in particular in the programs where kids under 12 can't get the vaccine, we felt that you know, our moral obligation in our preschools to require the vaccine. And we had already last year required the flu vaccine um, uh, going into the flu season last year. So that the, the, the idea of a, a vaccine mandate wasn't new to us. Um, but with our, our home and community-based services, we have a, a number of individual families who are served in their home by one or two waiver providers. And sometimes those waiver providers happen to be related to the individuals they're serving. And so we're also making a um, exception for those families who have decided uh, and those staff members who have decided not to get vaccinated as long as they're signing a waiver and a release, um, allowing that to occur uh, but we need to have that updated on an annual basis um, until we're on the other side of this uh, thing called COVID. So um, I think I will stop there, uh, James, and answer questions at the end. But that's that's how we arrived at the decision. Uh, we used the criteria. Um, thus far, the feedback has been positive. I had have had at least two other um, Easter Seals uh, uh, 
affiliates contact me um, for copies of our policy and our forms and our announcement. Um, I've, I will share that readily with anyone who's interested. One has already implemented it. I've also had two other IDD providers in the state of Arkansas contact me. Um, uh, and both of them have already implemented uh, a, a vaccine uh, mandate as well. So um, while we're, we're, we might have been the first in the state, uh, we're definitely not going to be the last and we're not going to be the last Easter seals as well. Thank you, Ron. I want to go right to David, but a real, real quick question. How many employees do you have, Ron, or how many people are affected by your decision? Yeah, we have, um, a, uh, we're a $30 million organization with 550 employees, um, and we serve about 800, 850 people directly. Okay, and then do you have a, a, a large number of volunteers as well? Are they affected by your policy? Yeah, um, due to COVID, our vo volunteers have not been allowed into our programs. Um, and so uh, that includes like students who are coming for internships or practicums and things like that. Um, and we're making exceptions for those who uh, have uh, the vaccine. Uh, that includes uh, volunteers who will, who will uh, maybe come to a fundraising event as well. We're requiring uh, proof of vaccination to be able to serve because oftentimes individuals that we serve are at our fundraising events. And so uh, just to protect everyone involved, um, had we not made the decision last March, uh, I should mention this, March 12th, we made our first COVID-related decision. We had a fundraiser with over 450 people um, set to attend, and um, one of the volunteers uh, who was set to work on the table, uh, the registration table, and then uh, the uh, silent auction table, who would have probably interacted with everyone there, tested positive for COVID a week later. She probably had been asymptomatic or was um, positive at the time of the event, but she could have infect, uh, infected um, the entire group of people that were coming that night. And um, unfortunately, that volunteer passed away uh, two weeks later, uh, one of the first uh, in Arkansas to die of COVID. So um, that was a very immediate reinforcement of, of our decision making and doing the right thing. Uh, even though it meant we may lose hundreds of thousands of dollars from the fundraising, um, our priority, like we said from the beginning, was health and safety of those we serve um, and the people that work for us. Well, um, that's that's uh, that's very sad, but and and obviously uh, uh, made an impression on your organization, um, Mr. Ivers. If you could please um, talk about uh, your role in this, uh, the kind of advice and counsel that you've had to give uh, to the CEO of the organization. Uh, and and uh, and if you could dive into, uh, I think the kind of pressing question for everyone very often is, hey, is this legal? You know, can you legally tell people uh, to um, uh, get vaccinated? Sure. So, as Ron mentioned, as we struggled with it, to me, the, there were three primary legal issues around it. I mean, um, we'd already been mandating the flu vaccine, so I didn't have, you know, a, a terrible um concern about precedent or that this, this was something we couldn't do it was more about how we could do it uh, legally as ron mentioned there's two main exceptions um that that every employer has to under title under the americans with disabilities act is one of them on, on title seven uh, is the other one for religious discrimination so every employer is is uh, a pretty much every employer in, in the united states for those uh, extremely small employers are subject to those laws. And then there's usually state versions of those laws as well. So under the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, you have to accommodate anybody with a disability related medical condition who cannot um, safely receive the vaccine. So we uh, are requiring for those employees to provide a physician certification. It's pretty standard procedure, just like we would do with the regular flu uh, vaccine exemption. However, if they get that exemption, uh, they still have to, they then have to provide, uh, to wear, uh, masks or depending on the situation, full PPE, depending on if they're serving somebody with known, uh, COVID, um, uh, a case, but they will have to, and then we're talking about how we may also screen uh, test weekly. We're still dealing with the implications of that because of the OSHA 
uh, emergency temporary standard, the ETS rule that, that impacts that. But we may also do like some employers have already announced that, that those employees uh, who don't get the vaccine will have to have weekly testing as well, which as you all know, that in itself is probably a deterrent to a lot of people requesting uh, an exemption. So that, that covers the, AD, the ADA exemption. And, and I think most employees are fairly familiar with that from other contexts. The other main exemption that I mentioned is the religious exemption. And we've got a number of employees who claim that with the flu shot. And we've already gotten at least one, I don't know, HR would know how many so far that I'll review. And we've created a template for them to use when requesting a religious exemption as well. Ordinarily, religious exemptions are not, I would say, uh, uh, scrutinized in a real harsh way due to some court decisions that have granted pretty broad leeway to employees to invoke that exemption. Um, my feeling is in this case, we may have to be a little more rigorous in our review if employees try to abuse it. Um, if we see inconsistencies, for instance, in what they're claiming is their religious beliefs and, and what they're doing in other regards, it's a little early to know if employees are going to actually abuse it or not. Um, I think I'll tell you that the one I'm struggling with is, is the employees who are requesting the exemption due to the uh, abortion issue, which has, it's a kind of an esoteric issue around fetal cell lines and all of that type of thing. And so I'm still doing some research on whether that is going to be a legitimate, um, uh, I guess, basis in, in these cases here, but you would probably uh, get some of those uh, as well. Some of them are more just general, like, you know, I don't, I don't introduce anything into my body. I believe that's against, that's against my biblical beliefs, any foreign um, substance, or I'm not sure exactly the phrasing that they would use, but um, those type of objections. Um, so we're dealing with the religious exemptions and those, those you pretty much just have to do one, by, you know, each one, one by one. And the law does allow you to do some interactive discussion uh, in the same way with the medical. You can go back to the physician or the religious. You can go back and ask permission to talk to their um, spiritual leader to find out if this is really true, what they're claiming about their spiritual beliefs and so on. In the past, we've not done a lot of that. We'll see in this case. Then I think a lot of you, it's not really an exemption, but it's a legal argument that we've heard. And I think you all will hear as well. There's already been one court case, the only court case uh, really, the one in Houston when the hospital there, the, the big hospital in Houston mandated the vaccine. And that is, can you do, can an employer require the vaccine uh, for employees, uh, even though it's has not got full FDA approval, it's got emergency use authorization or EUA. So in the past, I know I saw, I did a little research on this, that there was kind of a, what I would say, a tendency to believe that the Food and Drug Act, and I'll show you in a minute when I'm referring to the Food and Drug Act prohibited mandating uh, products, including vaccines subject to EU, emergency use authorization, but I believe with the severity and urgency of the COVID situation, legal scholars and, and the courts have started reviewing it more closely. And I did research in it and I basically concluded the same thing that most everyone has been concluding lately is that the Food and Drug Act does not prohibit uh, employers from mandating the vaccine. And the reason, and there's a paper, y'all can find it on the web, for anyone who's really interested in the in the intricate details of it, uh, it's dated July 6, 2021, and it's from the it's it's a memo to the deputy counsel to the president. And so the attorney general's office did a legal memo in which they explain why they do not believe that the Food and Drug Act prohibits employers, schools, and other private entities from mandating the vaccine. And, and it really, we, sorry, I'm sorry about that. It really revolves around the issue of, of whether or not the phrase, phrasing in the act that, that uh, 
the, the patient or individual has the option to accept or refuse administration of the product. And what the, I'm sorry, just a moment. So, and what the uh, DO, what the Attorney General concluded, Attorney General's office concluded, was that that really means that you cannot force someone <laughs> to get the vaccine, but and you can, and you can tell them that, and the F FDA's fact sheet is that the consequence of not getting the vaccine is your the healthcare, the way you will be treated as far as receiving health healthcare will not change. However, that is separate and apart from what a private entity such as an employer can do. And the memo concludes that private employers um, have, the, have the freedom, you know, as, as one would expect to impose uh, a man to say, yes, you're free not to get the vaccine, but if you make that decision not to get the vaccine, you will no longer be employed here. And so that's just, there's a lengthy discussion in it. Of course, the courts will have the final say, you know, if the, if the lawsuits continue. But like I said, the first one in Houston, the district court threw that out and, and said that the employers did have the authority to do that. And then there's also information on the COVID, uh, the CDC website that talks about, even though it was emergency use authorization, it's been subject to what they call EUA plus scrutiny, meaning it was far more rigorous than most uh, emergency use authorization. So that's a really a brief rundown of the legal issues. I'll tell you that for the exception that Ron mentioned with regard to our home and community-based services where we have families who want to go ahead and waive the requirement for their particular caregiver, especially a family member. Um, I had some concerns about that because of us making an exception. What happens if that caregiver who is our employee then uh, becomes ill uh, and we did not um, impose our, or did not consistently apply our policy and we knew there was a risk and so on. <clears throat> so what, we're, what we've done is we've just created a form that they have to sign that is an acknowledgement of the risks, the heightened risks that they are going to encounter. Um, we, we have one that the family signs and one uh, the, the client the individual or their guardian when I say the family, and then one that the worker signs. And in both cases, they're acknowledging the heightened risk of the employee not being vaccinated. They're accepting the risk and not looking to Easter seals uh, if something bad happens as a result of this decision if we grant the exemption. And um, I would, you know, if you do something like that, you just gotta be very consistent in how you apply it. Same way with the exceptions that I mentioned earlier. And, and finally, I'll just conclude, I think, by saying you know, in Arkansas and probably most states, um, the legislature dealt with the issue of immunity or tort immunity for businesses if someone um, does contract the virus. In Arkansas, the, the law is worded such that as long as we're uh, applying policies and procedures in good faith, that, that comport with the CDC and other public health authorities that will not be liable um, for someone contracting the, the virus. And so I'm just, you know, in, in other states that have similar laws, I would be careful to make sure that um, any exemptions, any exemptions you do apply or however you decide to administer such a program, that you keep that in mind, that you do uh, adhere as closely as possible to the public health authorities uh, so as not to lose any immunity that you might have in your state. And finally, um, on the workers' comp issue, that does come up as well. Employees want to know, well, I've contracted the virus, I'm sick, do I get workers' comp? And of course, you know, there's, each state has its own laws uh, with regard to what is or is not covered by workers' comp. But getting a vaccine in that context should be covered um, if it's an employer mandate. Now this is me talking not the Arkansas Workers' Comp Commission, but I would, I would argue that that should be covered by workers' comp if it led to uh, a, an actual injury or, or something that serious that rose to that level. So I hope that helps. Of course, I can answer questions at the end, I think is when. Yeah. 
Yeah, we'll do, we'll do that. Thank you so, so much. I really appreciate that. I'm going to go right to Dr. Kimberly. Uh, Dr. Kimberly, if you could just start, give us an assessment of kind of how this conversation with Easter Seals Arkansas is fitting into the bigger picture. Uh, and so in your view, as, um, as obviously as a, as a medical practitioner uh, about um, just, just what the ramifications of all of this are. But, you know, I think Ron um, touched on it when he said that this may be the beginning of a trend, uh, increasing numbers of businesses, of hospitals, of care facilities, and so forth, requiring vaccination of their employees. I personally think that it um, that it's that it's uh, accelerated by the Delta variant. Um, that that has you know kind of jolted us out of uh, kind of happy space we were in for, for the first half of the summer uh, as we were seeing, you know, not great vaccination rates, certainly not in across the South. We're not, we're not seeing the kind of vaccination rates we want to see and honestly that we need to see, but we did see falling cases. And so there was this somewhat disconnect between um, you know, the, the, the reality of what was happening in May and June and, and perhaps very early July uh, versus um, what the concern was. And in the background, burning through all this was increasing reports of the Delta variant. Um, this Delta variant, I, I cannot stress to y'all hard enough or, or, or fervently enough how, how dramatically more scary this virus is. Um, what, what has happened with the Delta variant, it arose in India and, 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 it, and it had a, it acquired a capacity to very rapidly cause very high concentrations of virus in someone's nose. And so what, what, what that means is that when someone's infected with the Delta variant, they will have 1,000 times more virus in their nose 1,000 times more virus than if they had been infected last year with the original strain of the COVID virus. And that probably is why it spread so much more easily. That's why it's, you know, we're seeing hospitalization rates not just go up, but go up exponentially. Uh, that's why m much of the modeling is saying we're going to be back to at least where we were in January and February, if not even worse. And everyone's, you know, going, whoa, you know, what, what do we do now? Um, the vaccines work. Uh, they work against the Delta uh, variant uh, in terms of protecting against moderate to severe disease and death. They work extremely well. Um, what they are not as able to do as well as with other variants <clears throat> is to prevent infection in the first place. And among people who have been vaccinated and get infected, they don't get really sick. They're, they're either asymptomatic or you know have mild cold or something, but they can have the kinds of very high amounts of virus in, in the nose that an unvaccinated person can. And that's why Tuesday of last week, CDC changed the recommendations. So now if you're indoors, everyone vaccinated or unvaccinated should be masked. That, that the virus has changed. And therefore, as we're learning more about this new variant of the virus, we have to be changing accordingly. I think that with that as a background, um, I think Ron's right. I think we're going to start seeing, I think we already are seeing, uh, increasing numbers of employers, including healthcare employers, saying um, we need to have our, our, our employees vaccinated. Uh, we already do it with influenza. I posted in the chat box at the very <clears throat> beginning of all this a, a joint statement from over 50 uh, major medical associations and nursing associations all um, you know, full-throated endorsing uh, the, uh, the, the mandatory aspect of, of COVID vaccination. We do it for the same reasons Ron mentioned, you know, to protect our patients first and foremost and protect ourselves and, and our colleagues that we work with and also to, to minimize disruptions in, the, in our ability to provide that care. So long-winded way to say, I think it's my, if I had a crystal ball, I'd say it's not only going to maintain a, 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 a pace, I think it's going to accelerate in terms of the pace of places doing that um, across the country. I think it's more likely to happen perhaps in, in parts of the country other than uh, the Deep South that initially, but you know, eventually this virus is going to be, it, it's going to get really bad over these next few weeks, really, really bad. And I think people will be forced to say, look, we can't keep doing this. We gotta do something different. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Kimberly. And if you could, um, uh, I'm just gonna ask you one uh, question uh, and then I'm gonna go to the questions from the audience here. But um, with regards to the contagious nature of the Delta 
Uh, if you could kind of speak specifically to that, because I think um, one of the things that is catching so many people's attention is that I, who am vaccinated, um, could be exposed uh, and transmit it. And I may or may not have any symptoms. I may have minor symptoms, um, but I could definitely transmit it to other people who are not vaccinated or are vaccinated for that matter. Uh, and that seems to be the special difference here with this. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, I mentioned already the thousandfold increased amount of virus in the nose. I mean, that that I think is a pretty a pretty straightforward conceptualization of well, if you got that much more virus in your nose, it's going to be easier to spread to somebody else. Um, at the very beginning of the pandemic, you know, of course, it, one of the things that frustrates a lot of people is that is that our recommendations have changed over time. They've shifted over time. Uh, of course, that's happened as we've learned more about the, the virus. This was not a virus that had seen human beings before. You know, we started recognizing it in December 2019, January, February, March 2020. So as we learn more about it, I would argue it's a good thing to then modify your recommendations according to the new knowledge that you have. And, and so uh, bear with us because the Delta variant is, is, is the new kid on the block and we've got more yet to learn. But knowing that it causes that much virus in the nose makes it easier to understand how it spreads to other people. And the fact that in a, in a vaccinated person, it has that much virus in the nose, therefore they probably as well can, can spread it to others. Back at the very beginning, as we were learning about the original strain of the virus, the R naught, which is a phrase that describes how many uninfected people one infected person can be expected to spread to, that R naught value was 2.5. So for every infected person, they would ex they would be expected to infect two and a half people. You can't obviously infect half a person, but you know it's an it's an average. Uh, now the R naught is 10. Uh, with the Delta virus, somewhere in the eight to 10 range. <clears throat> that means for every person who is infected, they're going to infect 10 other uninfected people because there's so much more virus in the nose. There's one pathogen, one virus that's more infectious than this, and that's measles. Smallpox is not as infectious as this. Uh, Ebola is not as infectious as this. Every other virus that causes the, you know, bird flu is not as infectious as this. Um, you know, th this, this is different. And that's why you hear, I, I think anyway, you can hear some urgency in my voice, some stridency in my voice, uh, because it will spread to others. If you're vaccinated, you will not get really sick from it. You won't die from it. That's good news. That's why we need to all be vaccinated. But until we, you know, basically get through this Delta variant period, uh, and we will get through it, you know, one way or the other, I just certainly hope it's with as few deaths as possible. Uh, we're going to have to be doing kind of an all of the above approach, uh, vaccination, masking, distancing, uh, and we may have to ramp that up and do more outside distancing again. I don't know that for sure. That's not where we are right now. But again, that's the, the, the changing aspect of what it is we're dealing with. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to try to get to as many as questions uh, as, or of these questions that are posted in the chat as possible. Uh, so if you could keep your answers short. Um, uh, first from Anita, uh, uh, could Ron describe his workforce and how many are DSPs? Did they do the Monday morning meetings? Sure, we have a combination of uh, full and part-time staff totaling about 530 to 550 people. Um, we're actively hiring because we're, we're trying to serve more people coming off the Medicaid wait list. But um, of that uh, total, uh, about 225 to 240 are direct support professionals. So those are our frontline staff that are providing you know, direct care. We also employ uh, nurses, um, therapists, uh, teachers. We run a K through 12 school um, and uh, two preschool programs at two different locations as well as outpatient therapy and an adult day program. So we have a variety of workers in a variety of different settings. And as the doctor was talking about, we're trying to, um, as we learn more, uh, adapt our policy and our, our approach um, to how we're uh, trying to navigate the virus. Okay, thank you. Um, and for those who may not have noticed, um, Mr. Eckstein has put his email address in the chat window. Uh, so feel free to uh, contact him through that email address. It's uh, rxstrand at easterseals, is it easterseals.ar.com. 
Um, and if you need that, uh, you can also email me. Those of you who registered, I can make sure I get you connected to them. Um, the, uh, there was a question posed in case folks didn't see it. How many folks have actually just left um, once you've decided to, um, to make this um, mandated? Uh, thus far, we've had nobody leave, but we're also giving people until uh, September 30th um, to get fully vaccinated. They have to have both vaccines uh, done. So we're, we're educating. We have a biweekly staff newsletter uh, that we started at the beginning of the pandemic. We had daily emails going out. Now it's evolved to a, a biweekly staff newsletter where we share all sorts of information, um, including the latest health and safety precautions and guidelines that people are expected to follow. Um, but as of um, today, there have been no resignations. Um, and in fact, we had, ten, we had ten, we have 10 nurses on staff and we thought 50% of them were just gonna refuse to get it. And I, I was kind of dumbfounded that those who were that close to it would refuse to get vaccinated. Well, it turned out um, three of them uh, actually already had gotten it uh, due to some of the education we were doing. And um, the other two, I think, uh, are going to be in the process of, of getting it. Um, one of the people who told us up front there was no way they were going to get it, I think, started looking at the alternatives and going into a work environment that wasn't vaccinated and decided this was a much safer place for them to stay and went and, go ahead, went and got their first vaccine. Uh, 60 vaccination cards have rolled in since the beginning of our announcement uh, just a week and a half, two weeks ago. Hey, thank you. Um, uh, to everyone uh, watching, uh, uh, Ron has agreed to uh, share the policy exemption forms um, and I, you can send them to me uh, and then I can make sure it gets to everyone who has registered for this event. So um, I, can, I can forward that to you. Uh, another question, this is from Rose. Uh, I'm wondering if there has been any cost projections for unemployment liability regarding employees being terminated based on this policy implementation. So are you kind of trying to factor out uh, that possibility and what you might have to do cost-wise there? But we have not factored that in. Okay. okay. Um, a, a, a general question, we have about 10 more minutes before we close. Um, a general question, uh, how has the uh, community, uh, Little Rock, the area that you serve, I think you said you serve a five or six county area. How have they reacted uh, to you? What kind of feedback have you gotten from the community at large? Yeah, as I, I think I mentioned earlier, when we, when we shared the news, we also shared it um, with uh, our social media um, on our various uh, pages. And we, we've had no negative feedback. It's, it's been overwhelmingly positive. I was expecting to have, you know, people trolling us and um, people being really uh, negative, but we did, I think, a really nice job of explaining the why and the criteria we used. And um, we cited data from uh, Arkansas's uh, health department about the Delta variant, um, you know, catching fire. We were in the middle of, of this pandemic. It's not over and it's, it's likely to get worse. And families have been overwhelmingly supportive uh, that we've taken this action. Um, and what's interesting is that there's only 15% of the staff uh, that have said they were re refusing it, but the 85% of the staff who have gotten it or plan to get it also appreciate the fact that we're taking this stand because we're helping protect them as well. So, um, you know, I think it, uh, people are free to choose whatever they want. Um, as long as they understand what the consequences are. And for us, the consequences of allowing people to continue to choose to be unvaccinated and potentially um, risk the health and lives of those that we are entrusted to serve just was not a trade-off we wanted to make. And, you know, I challenge the executive team with this thought, what happens six months from now? Will we regret more the fact that we made this bold decision and take some slings and arrows and some criticism? Or will we regret the fact that we did nothing and stood by and let the, the virus rage on and have the first death on our watch of someone that we serve? And, and we obviously chose the, the risk of, of public scrutiny and, and negative feedback versus the, the risk of someone losing their lives on our watch. Uh, Dr. Kimberly, um... Someone asked a question in the chat about uh, the people being served and the percentage of infection there. 
Um, how, what's the sort of the best way for organizations like Easter Seal of Arkansas or others around the country to really kind of track that as they sort of factor in what they're going to do with regards to their own staff? Um, because obviously in certain parts of the country, those rates are um, much higher than others. So I'm sorry, James, say that one more time. Let me, I want to make sure I understand the question. Yeah, in terms of the infection rates in the community that uh, okay. these, say, these organizations are serving. Yeah, so the, the, their county and, and state health departments, I know Jose Romero very well over in, over in Arkansas, so Jose would be the guy to go to there, uh, or his staff. He's, he's the chief uh, health officer with the state. <laughs> but but the, it would be, you know, it'd be the local health department the state health department and the CDC, that's where you're gonna to wanna to get your information. And, and the kinds of numbers you're gonna pay attention to are percent positivity of tests, um, that, that goes up first, then uh, uh, numbers of total cases, that goes up second, then numbers of hospitalizations, that goes up third, then number of ICU admissions, that goes up next, and then deaths goes up last. And, so, and we've seen that before, you know, it, 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 we know this pattern every, you know, week to two, you move from one group to the next to the next. And those are gonna be uh, tabulated at your state and your local level. So wherever you're, you're looking, that's where you look in terms of knowing what's going in your community. But keep in mind that as hospitalizations, like for instance, in Alabama are going up now, have been going up for about, about two weeks now, we're a little bit behind Arkansas in that, um, people think, well, everything's good. Nobody's dying right now. Just wait. Um, you know, four weeks from now, we're going to have a surge of deaths. You know, we've, we've, we've seen this movie before. This just happens to be the horror film version of it. And, and, and so that's what, that's what we got to keep our eyes on and, and, and follow the numbers as, as the person asking the question is seeking the information on how to do. And, uh, and this, I think, would be of interest to everyone. It's been suggested that uh, long haulers, those people who have long-term effects from COVID, uh, may become the single largest uh, category of people with disabilities who will enter uh, our population in these coming years, uh, because we're talking potentially millions. Would that be correct, Dr. Kimberlin? Yeah, you know, it's, I, had, I had not thought of that before. That's a really decent point to think through. Um, you know, 30, 40 percent plus maybe of people who've had COVID will have some sort of that long haul COVID kind of uh, scenario. That includes children as well. And, um, and when you think about the numbers infected during this pandemic, that could quite possibly be uh, a, real, a real issue that we'll all be facing. I, I had not thought of it in terms of that kind of starkness of the way you phrased it. Uh, let me just check and see if we have any other, haven't asked that, um, let's see. Uh, we appreciate that Dr. Kimberly is speaking to us today to share his accurate information. Yes, because data is so, so critical to this. Uh, depend on the sources that Dr. Kimberly has suggested um, and not social media and not your neighbor. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm curious uh, if folks are willing to, obviously you don't have to disclose names or any sort, but I'm just kind of curious um, uh, in, in terms of everyone who's on the call today, um, if you know someone um, who has uh, become seriously ill or passed away from COVID, uh, and uh, because I'm trying to get a sense of how it's affecting us, and I certainly have, I knew someone who died recently of COVID and have had a family member sick, but I'm just wondering if people might just raise their hands if, if you've been affected uh, personally in some way. Well, James, as, as people are raising their hand, I'll mention my father died of COVID last November. In Texas. Very sorry to hear that. Very sorry to hear that. So I see a number of folks. Yeah, it's um, it's something that's permeating obviously the entire society. So this is a critically important discussion. I know that uh, those of you out there who are running organizations uh, want to know what you can and cannot do with regards to this issue. Uh, but it's something that's uh, picking up steam fast uh, because, as Dr. Kimberly mentioned, uh, the Delta variant is is having such a devastating impact. Uh, any closing comments? Uh, we'll just go around, Dr. Kimberlin, and then yeah, you, you asked you asked a, the personal question about loss um, uh, earlier this week. Well, my mother is the, my mother and father were both in a long term care facility in Austin, Texas, where they lived their whole lives, um, and the virus got into that in November, probably late October, and and dad, mom and dad both acquired it, and dad died within five or six days. Um, mom survived. She, she actually was asymptomatic and now she's fully vaccinated, but she's still on the same long term long term care uh, skilled nursing unit. And earlier this week, I got an email with the letter attached PDF letter attached to it saying that they have done exactly what is being discussed here. They're um, uh, requiring vaccination of everybody who worked there. 
and I promise you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm medical as well, but, but my reaction was that was the reaction of a son. And I literally, I'm in my office door open and I literally yelled, thank God. Um, because it, you know, it, 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 it's, it, that's the kind of response that the families of the patients you all care for will feel. That's what they will say when they learn that their loved one is even safer because of the difficult, um, potentially difficult decisions that, you know, Ron and his group made, for instance, um, they made it for all the right reasons. And to have that peek into the boardroom in terms of him talking among his staff and saying, what do we want six months from now? That was the most powerful part of this whole hour. And I, I learned a lot and I appreciate very much the opportunity being with you all today. Thank you, Doctor. Um, uh, Mr. Ivers, if you have any closing comments, and then I'll go to Ron. Um, just to, from a legal standpoint, I would just emphasize, uh, you know, every place is different, each state and what have you, whatever you do, do it consistently to avoid legal issues, but you can mandate it. Um, I feel, you know, that the courts will eventually uphold that. Um, but in any event, just be very consistent with your personnel, uh, your human resources. And then Ron, any final thoughts? Yeah, as a leader, uh, sometimes we have to make some very difficult decisions. Um, never thought about this being a life and death decision um, when COVID started, but that's really what it's turned out to be. And for those of you who are thinking about it, I would really encourage you to, to be bold in this moment. Um, history will not look down on you for having made the decision uh, to actually uh, mandate uh, vaccines. And, and I would encourage you to you know, adopt it in a way that you can implement. Um, it was probably the single biggest decision we've made since I've been here. And I got to tell you, on the other side of having made the decision, there's this huge sigh of relief and sense of uh, relief that the entire leadership team has. And again, nothing but positive feedback has been coming in. And one of the reasons I wanna share the decision and, and that is just to help support any leaders out there who are uh, on the fence trying to decide whether they should or shouldn't do it. Um, here is a resource and happy to help, uh, help you navigate that. So um, thank you for allowing us to participate today and, and share our story. Thank you, Ron, uh, so much for uh, spending your time with us and all of your insight. Uh, I'm going to allow Armando Contreras, our CEO, to uh, close us out today. Yeah, James, thank you. Uh, Dr. Kimberlin, thank you so much. Um, David Ivers, yeah, I really appreciate you know the legal advice. And, and Ron, thanks for caring about human life and also for being one of the many pioneers that are moving in this direction for mandatory vaccinations. I wanna thank everybody um, on the call here, on the Zoom call, especially the UCP affiliates. And James, as always, thank you for your expertise and moderation and putting this together. Um, so everybody have a, a great day, be safe, be well. Thank you.